Thanks everyone for having me here. Um, it's an honor to come and share some of our work that we're doing with regard to bovine congestive heart failure. Um, I, I'm gonna talk about two different sort of conditions or diseases today. One of those being what got Colorado State into this line of work, which is high altitude disease, because that's gonna lay the groundwork for where we, where we currently are with this. It's, it's kind of a, a misnomer, a bovine congestive heart failure, but what I wanna do is, is really just lay the groundwork for what I'm gonna to refer to as feedlot heart disease, because they're all driven from the same type of, uh, they're all driven from hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, which results in right-sided heart failure. They both end up in the same place, but they both start from slightly different places. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna lay the groundwork on what we know about high altitude disease. I'm gonna talk about PAP testing, pulmonary arterial pressure EPDs. And then I'm gonna talk about this project that we are currently working on that has been graciously funded um, that allows us to understand the relationship between PAP and this feedlot, the, these uh, feedlot heart failure. So I'm just gonna kind of step forward. So, you know, we've got, there's been a number, they, they tell me to look at this, but I, I, I always have the habit of turning around and looking at that. I'm supposed to look at the audience. Um, they, 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 there's been a number of people that have had their hands in this work, and it's by no means the work of myself. Um, you know, you can look at a whole host of, of different people and collaborators here. Um, I, I really wanna point out, you know, Dr. Enns and then Dr. Thomas, um, who, are, who are both breeding and genetics faculty at Colorado State University. We've had the unfortunate that Dr. Thomas left us and went to Texas A&M, um, but, you know, we've got a number of grad students. I want to point out, I'm gonna have a number of slides up here from my PhD student, uh, Isabella Cooker, there on the bottom. She's running this, this feedlot heart failure project uh, for me. She's, she's lifting, doing all the heavy lifting for me so I can, I can spend more time teaching undergrads. <laughs> so, um, I really want to point out Dr. Tim Holt. And I don't know if any of you know who of Dr. Holt or or have ever met him, but he is, the, he is the driver of pulmonary hypertension research in the United States. He, he started, he's a, he's a veterinarian over in the uh, CSU's uh, College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, he, he travels all around the world doing pap testing. He's been to Ethiopia. He just got back from Peru. Um, and he's tested cattle upwards above 14,000 feet in elevation. Uh, in Peru, he was averaging about 12,000 feet in elevation pap testing cattle. So he is, he is the world-renowned expert on a lot of this information that I'm gonna show you, okay? So a number of the slides that I have on here, I obtained from him, and I'm a geneticist, okay? I like to take the data and analyze it, so I'm gonna try to explain what he wants me to convey to you guys um, in order to uh, ha have this go forward. But we have, we have a number of people on here. You know, it's interesting because there's a lot of interest in this, not from the beef world, but also from the humans, the human, the human world. So we have Kurt Stenmark and Dale Brown who are faculty members at the UC, uh, UC Anschutz Medical Center down in Denver and they are using beef cattle as a model for pulmonary hypertension in children. So um, we've done quite a bit of work with them. And I also wanna thank our collaborators. And I've got some listed here and I remember I realize now that I've left some off. Um, you know, we're currently, with this grant has been sponsored with ABS and Cactus Feeders, High Plains Feed Yard. We do quite a bit of work with the, with the scientists at, at Clay Center. Um, and, and also now more recently with the American Angus Association and then both in the American Simmental Association and their, their genetic evaluation arm of International Genetic Solutions. Okay, so I kind of alluded to this earlier. My goal, I'm, I'm not, like I said, I'm not a physiologist. So what my, our goal for this, 
and I'm speaking selfishly, my goal, is to develop selection tools in the form of EPDs to reduce the incidence of pulmonary hypertension and their associated mortalities, okay? Particularly, pulmonary, with regard to pulmonary hypertension, we're gonna talk about high altitude disease first, because like I said, that's gonna lay the groundwork of where we need to go, and then we're gonna talk about what we're, the, what we're seeing as we develop this prediction tool for feedlot heart failure. All right, so let's talk about beef cattle for a minute. All right, beef cattle have a distinct biological disadvantage when it comes to their cardiopulmonary system if we, if we look at them in, or we compare them to other livestock species. So particularly, if we think about the size of a beef animal, right? So the, the next best comparison is going to be to that of the horse, right? They're about similar size. Beef cattle might be a little bit bigger. Horses might be depending on the breeds and, and everything else that go along with it. But if you look at the size of the lungs, okay? Beef cattle have about a third of the size. Their lungs are about a third of the size of that of horses, okay? So if, if we think about just volume and capacity of the lungs, Equine lungs can be filled up with 55 liters of air, 55 liters of volume. Cattle have 12 liters of air capacity, and humans have six, right? So we're half of what beef cattle are, but given our size compared to theirs, there seems something a little bit, a little bit off here. And just in case that it doesn't quite strike you, my grad student pulled up these pictures, and you look at a set of these inflated lungs, there's a huge, that is a huge discrepancy there in terms of the size of the lungs from a beef animal there on the left to those of horses there on the right, right? Well, horses are bred for endurance and, and, you know, and, and speed and, and everything else that goes along with that. But if you just look at the sheer size with, with respect to their body weight or body size, cattle are at a disadvantage, right? And this is part of what stems all of these pulmonary hypertension problems, right? So I'm gonna lay the groundwork on why this is a problem, and we're gonna start with high altitude disease, okay? So high altitude disease was first reported back in 1889 in South Park, Colorado. It's not the cartoon, and for those of you that watch TV, if you, if you don't, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty funny, uh, I guess, my generation likes it better than most of you guys out here. But, um, <laughs> um, but about nine to 10,000 feet in South Park, Colorado, they started seeing these, these animals that were having these sort of cardiovascular problems. It was first misdiagnosed as diphtheria, okay? But we know now that that's not the case. And you know the first reports were from Colorado at the time, but it was hypothesized that it was ha happening in the other high mountainous states as well. So I'm talking about Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, New Mexico, right, where, where we have elevation. And, and at the time, that's where we were seeing high altitude disease, right? Seven, eight, nine, ten thousand feet in elevation. Now we're seeing it down. 4,500 feet in elevation, 5,000 feet in elevation. Why is this creeping downward? That's the question we're asking, okay? So what's happening? So if we look at elevation, right? So I've got a, I've got a this graphic here has a number, of different, a number of different locations around the world, and it displays how much oxygen there is available to them with respect to the oxygen available at sea level. So if you look there on the left, there's, there's Denver, the Mile High City at 5,200 feet in elevation. And in Denver, there's 83% of the oxygen available in Denver as there is at sea level. So that doesn't seem like a lot of a, a big decrease, 17% decrease over sea level. But I tell you what, if, you, if you're not used to being in Denver and you go to Denver and you try walking up a set of stairs, you're gonna notice it pretty quickly, right? So as we move up in elevation, so we get up there, the third one in is Park City, that's 10,000 feet in elevation. It's not uncommon in Colorado to have cattle grazing at nine to 10,000 feet in elevation in some areas. 
and we're at 70% of the available oxygen as compared to sea level. So as we go up, we're having a decrease in atmosphere or available atmospheric oxygen. So you're going into what is called a hypoxic environment, right? And this lack of oxygen is what's driving high altitude disease. So the progression, what happens? So this, this progression here uh, this is another slide I want to thank uh, Dr. Holt for, for helping, me, helping me out with. Um, it all starts with this alveolar hypoxia, right? And so that's just, that's a, a fancy term for saying the lungs don't have enough oxygen to oxygenate the blood, right? So they're in a hypoxic environment. So what does the body do? The body has to do something in order to help maintain those tissues in this hypoxic environment. So the first thing that it does, and so when, you in, when you're in a state of hypoxia, if you would look at the lungs, and I'm gonna kinda go here on my chest, the, the upper areas of the lungs is where the most oxygen is in, the, in, in those lungs. The bottom sections of the lung is, is there's less oxygen. So the body's first response is, well, let's push the blood up to those areas that are more highly oxygenated, right? And it does that by constricting the pulmonary arteries within the lungs, okay? So in order to do that, those vessels have to have a physiological change. And so those vessels constrict, but they also begin to remodel. And this is where beef cattle com be comes into a problem because as soon as we have that remodeling, Beef cattle don't ever go back from that, right? So humans, if we have this, we have the same cascade of events in response to a hypoxic environment, and we can get out of that environment, and if we stay out of that hypoxic environment, then the human, the, the vessels in humans will actually revert back to normal. In beef cattle, once they begin this process of, of constricting and remodeling, it doesn't, it, they don't change back. So that's one of the issues with cattle, okay? Another issue besides the lung size. So this remodeling, what, what they're essentially doing is, is they're restricting the volume or the diameter of those pulmonary arteries, okay? And you can think of it as like a garden hose, right? So you have a flow of water through a garden hose. If you constrict that opening, you're gonna increase the pressure and it, the water's gonna go out farther, squirt out farther, right? It's the same thing with a blood vessel. They constrict that opening, and then when the heart pumps, it pushes that blood, there's more pressure to push that blood up, higher up into the lungs. So the heart has to work harder because it's pushing more pressure, right? So then the heart begins to grow, particularly the right side of the heart. So if you look over here on, this, on these graphics, the right side of the heart in, in the blue there, the, the right side of the heart, the blood comes from the body, the deoxygenated blood, it comes into the right atrium, which is that first little, I don't know if I, I can point right there, it's the first little chamber right there, the right atrium, and then it goes down into the right ventricle, and this right side of the heart is what pushes the blood back to the lungs for reoxygenation, it comes back to the heart through the left ventricle and then the, the left ventricle pushes it out to the rest of the body, okay? So the right side of the heart, because there's greater pressure pushing it up into the lungs, begins to grow, okay? The muscle, it begins to increase in size. So as you keep going, if you're, you're pushing this and pushing this and pushing this, the heart becomes overworked and then you end up with something that's called ventricular dilation where the muscle ends up breaking apart and it loses all ability to pump blood. And then that's where we end up with right congestive heart failure, okay? And the result of that is, well, first, before we do that, so the critical piece here for uh, high altitude disease is the cause of genetic, or environmental, and it's a little bit of both, right? Because the environment causes this hypoxia and the response can be genetic. But this is the same cascade that happens with feedlot heart failure in cattle that never, are never reside or never uh, live at elevation. 
we call it, in Colorado, we call them non-native cattle, right? The cattle that have never been at elevation, we call them non-native, okay? So what this, oh, before I get into that, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So in terms of that vasoconstriction, we've got some histopathological slides here. So you'll notice here that on a normal pulmonary artery, we've got a big volume in there, and that's gonna be the inside of the, the artery, and then you've got the walls around that. Once cattle have that pulmonary hypertension, you'll notice the thickening of those arteries and then the decrease in that volume, that volume or the middle of that, middle of that artery. I'm sure there's a, a special term for that that I'm, I'm not um, thinking of right now, but um, that's what causes that increased pressure and allows those animals to adapt. And then if you look at a section of lung tissue, Right, so here on a normal animal, you see this lung tissue and, and look, and all the white here is all the, all the arteries and all the capillaries within the lungs, and this is where the blood flows to, in order to, be, to become oxygenated, right? So when cattle start shunting that blood in order to push it further up into the lungs, so we have a, a, a PAP score of 80 here where we have all this vasoconstriction going on. You'll notice the absence of those capilla that capillary tissue there, right? So what that does is rather than having all this extra space for all this blood to leak out, it's not really leak out, but go all, the, all over the lung and then get oxygenated, it's pushing everything up. So all that pressure within these builds and it backs up all the way back into the pulmonary artery and back into the heart. And so what we end up with is something like this, right? So this is brisket disease, okay? You'll notice the swelling and the edema in the brisket region of all these animals. These, all these animals are, are, extra, are, are in late stages of brisket disease and Dr. Holt took all of these pictures and he probably euthanized every one of those animals, right? Because there's no coming back from this, okay? So that's what we call brisket disease or high mountain disease. It all started because there was a hypoxic environment due to a lack of oxygen at elevation, okay? So how do we, how do we measure PAP, right? So, um, so PAP, if we think about this, I had, a, I had another grad student that put this together. Um, so if we think about PAP, so what has to happen to measure PAP is you have to run an animal into a squeeze chute, you have to restrain them, you have to tie off their head, they go into their neck and, what, and then we stick a large gauge needle into the jugular vein, okay? And then so Dr. Holt will then come in and he runs this catheter, or this probe down, in, down to the jugular vein, down into the right atrium, through the right ventricle and into the pulmonary artery just as it's leaving, just as it's leaving the heart. And then so this probe has a, a, a pressure sensor on it and he takes a pressure measurement. And so he ends up with on his little oscilloscope there and it, it gives a wave and, and it actually calculates. So you have a, di a, a systolic and diastolic PAP, just like you do when you go to the doctor and you get a blood pressure. And then the PAP score that's reported is the average, it's, it's a weighted average of those two systolic and diastolic measures, okay? <coughs> So that's PAP, it's an invasive procedure, right? So, like I said, Dr. Holt has been PAP testing animals since the 70s. And I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of animals he's done over his career, but it's, it, he's sitting probably over a half a million animals so far. Um, you know, it's a process that takes a couple minutes to do. He's pretty quick. Once it's in, he's, he's in and out. He's, he's very adept at what, at what he does. Um, so that, those numbers have allowed us to calculate heritability estimates. And so what heritability tells us is it's the percent of genes that influence differences in a trait, okay? So heritability ranges from zero to one. So a, a zero heritability means that air, all the differences that are observed in that trait are due to environmental differences. A heritability of zero means all the differences in that trait are due to, 
are due to um, differences in genetics between individual animals, okay? So pap heritabilities, I've got a range of estimates. There's, a, 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 there's a, more than this, I could fill up a couple of slides with all the different heritability estimates out there. So I just took a random sampling. And you, we see heritability, depending on the population, ranges from 0.25 to about 0.46. So I'm not counting that, that 0.56 uh, for weaning, weaning up there, because that's, that's a different trait than, than the yearling heritability that everything else is there. But those are, that's a pretty impressive heritability uh, estimate, particularly when, if you look at some of our other more routinely or historically selected for characteristics such as weaning weight, carcass weight, it puts the genetic control of PAP right in the range of everything else that we've selected for in recent history, right? Carcass weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, right? All, we're right in that range. So because of that substantial genetic control, we could make quite a bit of difference in terms of high, uh, selecting animals that are more tolerant to high altitude adaptability. The other thing that we need for EPDs are data, right? And so this is kind of leading me into, leading me into the, the feedlot heart failure um, piece of this at low elevation. So we've done some two different projects. Um, the, the top one there is, is, is a project that we did with Leachman Cattle of Colorado, where he's got, uh, we have PAPs that were measured below 5,500 feet in elevation and PAPs that were measured, oh, probably about 8,000 feet in elevation. And you see the heritabilities there are on the diagonal. So the high elevation heritability in this top, in this top bar is 0.37, and the heritability below is 0.26. And we see a genetic correlation of 0.79. So that means they are highly related, okay? This bottom one, that bottom one is, is some work that we had another grad student do, and this was the foundation work for the American Angus Association PAP EPD that, that they are currently doing produ production runs on. And this, this American Angus Association EPD, we, we've got the same similar heritability estimates, very similar genetic correlations. But what this does is it allows us to use PAPs from a, a wide range of elevations in order to predict the EPD of interest, okay? So in this case, for high altitude disease, we want a, a, an EPD for high altitude adaptability. But in terms of feedlot heart failure, we want an EPD for low altitude adaptability, essentially. So we can use this information, but it allows us to use a swath of information, just like we take carcass, you know, you look at carcass and you measure, you do ultrasound scans and you use that data to add information to the trait of interest. So we have the ability to collect PAP at different altitudes. We have the ability to use all that data and predict the make the prediction that we want. So in terms of carcass and performance, so one of the things that we have to be aware of when you develop a new EPD is you can't just throw an EPD out there like a grenade and let it go off and see what happens, right? You gotta kinda have an understanding on what's happening with everything else. Is it genetically related to carcass traits? Is it genetically related to other economically important traits? Because as soon as you start making selection pressure on that new EPD, if it's genetically related, you're going to change everything else that it's genetically related to. So you need to adjust your, your selection criteria somewhat in order to fully manage how, how the change is done in, a, in, a, in the most economical way possible. So in terms of what we know for uh, PAP and carcass traits, we know that carcass traits have weak to moderate relationships with PAP. Those are positive, so meaning as carcass traits tend to go up, PAP tends to be higher. We know that larger cattle tend to have higher PAP scores, so meaning the bigger body size or the, uh, the greater the weight, the higher the PAP score. More heavily muscled cattle have higher PAP scores or more risk to pulmonary hypertension. Another interest here is PAP. High PAP cattle are less efficient in terms of uh, dry matter intake and 
feed efficiency, so they consume more feed. And the other thing that we just found is that this, this pulmonary hypertension or stress influence meat quality in the retail case. So we actually are seeing reduced shelf life on meat that's sitting in the case than from high PAP animals than from low PAP animals. And we're still trying to investigate out why and try to figure out what that relationship is and why that's happening. But with that all being said, we've come up and we've put out PAP EPDs. Um, these are just some summary statistics. So the American Angus Association, I don't remember when I pulled this data. It was probably, I don't know, earlier this summer from one of their runs. Um, we see a difference between animals of 14.2 and lower PAP is better, higher PAP is, is poorer. And depending on the elevation on where animals are being used, the Beef Improvement Federation has a set of guidelines to guide the use of PAP and EPDs for particular elevations. We've just finished up a prototype for the American Simmental Association and, and their um, genetic evaluation arm of international genetic solutions. And these are the summary statistics there. Uh, a little bit different averages, but same range. And it's probably because they have about the same heritability estimate. Uh, and we've done some others. We've done uh, Leachman Cattle of Colorado, but I wanted to point out that this uh, John E. Rouse Beef Improvement Center um, it says there's 7,000 plus PAP observations. I, I would say there's probably over 9,000 now. Um, and, and this is the data that has driven, that has driven the, the development of these PAP EPDs for both Angus and, and IGS. Are we doing questions now or holding it? How, how do we, do we want to wait till the end? Let's wait till the end. We'll, we'll wait till the end. Okay. All right. So high altitude disease, we've got high altitude disease, covered that, um, you guys don't have that problem here in Kentucky, obviously, right? I had to look up the elevation and I was, thought it was higher than it was, but it's only 900 feet or something, you know, 800 feet. Um, but let's talk about the relationship between feedlot heart disease. So feedlot heart disease is a condition that began affecting cat, that we started to take notice of it, at least at CSU, back in 2018, 2019. And, and what happened was is cattle at late in the feeding period started dying of heart failure, right-sided heart failure, like I said, late in the feeding period, you know, weeks before harvest, okay? So right now the current direct cause is really not unknown. We know that these individuals are experiencing the heart, the same exact heart remodeling as what happens with brisket disease, but we're investigating why this is happening because they are experiencing some form of hypoxia in their cardiopulmonary system. And it's not from elevation, it's from some other unknown, unknown reason. So again, the clinical signs for feedlot heart failure, again, you'll notice you've got the swelling of the brisket and you look at those, uh, this red calf up here has got that, that, distended, jugular, that distended jugular vein. That, that calf has an extremely high pap measure and he's, he's not that old. And so if you look at that jugular vein popping out, that is a sign of a high pulmonary arterial pressure score. So that calf is going to be in trouble really soon, okay? So as I said, PAP scores are, PAP is an invasive procedure, right? And, and, and there's not a lot of feedlots out there. They're gonna let us go in and squeeze down their fat cattle, you know, three weeks before harvest and, and start taking some PAP measure. Oh, wow, 10 minutes, okay. Um, so we've developed this scoring system. It ranges from one to four or one to five, we don't see fives in the, in the feedlot. What we do see though is as you go from one, which is a normal heart, three and progress, you see the increase in the size of that right ventricle, right? That, that growth of that right side of the heart. And then once you get into heart failure, we've lost all muscle tone and that heart will lay down on a table and look like a flat deflated basketball. There is no muscle tone or anything with that heart. And that animal has died from, from heart failure. 
And again, I talked about what, the, what they look like inside. So you've got a normal heart here, and then you look at how this, this heart, all, the, all the, the interior of that heart has just become blown out, right? This is, this is where the swelling and the edema from the brisket comes from. Okay, so I got 10 minutes, so I'm gonna start picking it up here pretty quick. Um, so we got this grant, I just wanna acknowledge um, FFAR, the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research and um, the International Consortium for Antimicrobial Stewardship in Agriculture. They funded this project, it's a three year project, we're currently in the third year, and our goals is really to identify the relationship between PAP and heart score and, come up and to develop a heart score EPD. Um, one of the things that we're doing is we're looking at how PAP changes across the feeding period and, and how that relates again to heart score. So let's look at some phenotypic differences real quick. Let's describe the data. Um, our goal with this project is to have a 4,500 head of cattle uh, phenotyped and genotyped. Um, and we've got two groups. We've got a set of, of, of straight beef type animals. They're Angus influenced. And then ha the other half of these are gonna be beef on dairy, beef on dairy animals, okay? So I'm just presenting the beef, the beef animals. And like I said, we've got, we're finishing our third year and the next, the, the last set of data is gonna be collected here in, in the next couple of months as, as those animals are harvested. So in this data set, we're seeing, you know, this is our distribution of heart scores range for, you know, we've got the scoring system of one to five. We, uh, ones and twos are variations of normal. And then threes and fours and fives are all animals that are experiencing heart failure. In this population, we're seeing 29% of the animals come across that have some form of heart failure. Um, in other populations that we do, that number is as high as 50% that are coming across. So it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty big, um, a pretty big um, problem. Um, due to time, I'm gonna skip over this, but I, because I've got some other slides that illustrate the same thing. But I, I just wanna point out that if we look at the PAP, the 14 month PAP shows a, a strong relation with heart score, nine month PAP did not. And I'll show you why that is here on, on the next um, few slides, okay? So these next slides I'm gonna go through they're all set up the same way. We've got, our, we've got our, our, our estimates, our statistical estimates of PAP here across the x-axis is our heart scores one through four because we don't have any fives. And then on the y-axis, I've plotted those on this line. So you see for the nine month PAP, it's pretty flat. There's no relationship. As you get to the, uh, the 14 month PAP or the late PAP, you see an increase as you go from three, and then you go as you go from a three to a four. There's a big there's a big jump there in that in that um, relationship. Let's look at carcass characteristics. So we see marbling score as you go from a one to a four. Marbling score is is linearly decreasing. Okay, I don't think that that's a result of uh, that's causing the heart failure. I think that's a result of the animal being in heart failure. And then you look at these carcass weight down here. So this is carcass weight. And you look at the heart score, it's a curvilinear relationship. The highest carcasses are, are those animals with the heart score of three. And then as soon as they start getting into heart failure, that starts falling, falling off. Weight gain in the, so we, we measured feed intake on these. So weight gain across the, that, that feed intake period is exactly the same. We see that same, that same relationship there between, between uh, as we do with carcass. So the highest, the highest weight gain is, is over here with a heart score of three, and then it falls, it begins to fall off there as you go from a three to a four. I'm gonna skip this because we've kind of talked about it because I, I wanna get into this sequential pulmonary arterial pressure measures. So we PAP tested these once when they came into the feed yard, and then once a couple weeks before harvest, okay? So you'll notice the nice distribution here on um, this nine month PAP. So everything was less than 50. So at the elevation that we PAP tested these, there were no animals that were, had any issues with pulmonary hypertension. That was all an acceptable, those are all acceptable values. But when you take those same animals and you do them right before harvest, look at what happens to that distribution. Some of them stay the same, 
but some of them are really blowing up. And so what's, what's the cause of that, right? Um, if we look, and I'm gonna jump ahead here to, to this one, okay? If we look at these by heart score, now you see, again, on our nine month PAP, we've got a heart score of, of one, two, three, and four. And then as you go to that 14 month, they're, they're all higher, right? Which you would expect because they're bigger and heavier and, and everything else that's associated with that. But as you look at these animals at heart score of four, I mean, we have a, a, a very exponential relationship going on here that's showing that that PAP is definitely related to heart score, right? And the reason again for that is because heart score is what we need to collect. We can't collect PAP on these animals. Um, at least packers won't allow us to do it. <laughs> so let's talk about the genetics associated with heart score and genetic correlations. Okay, so again, that's summary of the data. So here on this chart, um, I've got these six different traits, heart score, PAP, carcass weight, back fat, ribeye area, marbling. On the diagonal, we have the heritability estimate. So our heart score heritability estimate is 0.28. So it's right in that range of PAP. And, and there was actually a paper that came out just this year um, that came from Buchanan and others out of Simplot in Idaho. And they, they published a heart score uh, heritability and, and theirs was about 0.3 or something. And so we're, we're very similar in terms, of our, in terms of our estimates. The big takeaways here though, is if you look at the genetic correlations with heart score, we see that back fat and marbling are, are fairly lowly correlated. So there's not a lot of genetic relationship between back fat and marbling. But as soon as you get to ribeye area, and this goes back to that muscling, that muscling remark, the heavier muscled animals tend to have higher heart scores. Right, so that's to me that's a, a, a key, a key uh, teller. Then if we look at PAP and carcass weight, well, let's look at carcass weight first because I think that one's the most interesting. That's a 0.63. That is an extremely high genetic correlation. Okay, that means that 63% of the genes that influence carcass weight are also the same genes that influence heart score. Okay, so. Animals with bigger genetics for growth tend to have higher heart scores. And then the PAP, we know it's, oh, we, know it, we know PAP is related, and that was taken a couple weeks before their harvest, so it's, it, that, that high genetic correlation doesn't really, doesn't really uh, surprise me all that much. Okay, in summary, am I doing good? Okay. In this data, we had relatively high incidence of hearts where remodeling has occurred. And so looking at 29%, like I said, there's others, there's others that, that are there. Um, we're not seeing animals with a heart scores of five make it, make it to harvest. Um, if you look at that Simplot data, they have heart scores of five, but they have a little di different uh, you know, business model that allows them to realize animals rather quickly and get, get them harvested. So they find an animal that's having an issue, it's gone, that, it's gone within a couple of hours. So they, they are seeing those in the plant. Um, we see 14 month PAP is have, showing a relationship with heart score and higher PAPs are indicating higher heart, heart scores, okay? And the big thing though, tying this back to high altitude disease where PAP is collected at a year of age, we're still a little unclear as to the relationship between that earlier PAP and heart score because we did these at two periods. This year in this group of cattle, we just, we did PAP at a year of age. And what, what's gonna end up happening is, is we're looking at that relationship, year, yearling PAP and heart score in this next group that's coming through that are gonna be harvested here in a couple months. Okay, so phenotypically what's happening, we're seeing trends of increase in heart score indicate decreases of inefficiency, and then increases in heart score with decreases in carcass characteristics, particularly carcass weight and marbling score. Okay, so those are antagonistic relationships. We see PAP increases across the feeding period. We have a, a good heritability to work with, and we're seeing some antagonistic correlations between heart score and carcass characteristics, particularly carcass weight and ribeye area. 
So just some things to consider, right? So this is, this is my last wrap up slide. The best approach, you know, I'm always about looking for more data. Um, you know, and our big question is high elevation, is high elevation PAP related to late term feedlot death? And our ongoing research is, is working to establish this. And the other big key piece that I want to put out here is, is you know, all of our work at CSU um, and the work out of Simplot is showing that PAP is a highly poly, well, this is, this is PAP. This is a, a these are genome-wide association studies. And so these are called Manhattan plots. And, and each different color represents a different chromosome. And all of the different dots represent all of the different SNPs on that chromosome. And then the height of these represents significance. So if you get a peak that's way up here, that means there's, there's one gene or QTL that's really influencing, that's really influencing the trait. If you look at these for pulmonary arterial pressure, and if you look at these for heart failure, there's really no overriding gene that's, that's influencing these. So we call these highly, highly polygenic traits. And so, you know, a lot of the questions we get in terms of, you know, can we do a molecular test or something for this? And, and you know, our, our, our answer from CSU is really kind of no because of this high, high polygenic nature. So, you know, our recommendation is in the form of some EPD that captures all of the variation rather than just a single, a single piece. So and with that, um, that's not fescue. <laughs> that's not fescue there. That's, that's not going to make them sick. <laughs> we want to encourage you to, if you have a couple of questions now, we'll take a couple or three right now, but, but write down any you'd like to ask at the end of the session today when we have all three speakers. So. Anybody have a burning question? Please hold up your hand. We have Mike back here. Got one back in the back. Yeah, if you go, if you go back to that genetic slide, you showed the max and min and the Angus and scimitol breed, and you showed the average. Yep. When you kick off the outliers, the two tails, realistically, where does 95% of the population fall? And my follow-up question would be, from a selection standpoint, where do your commercial breeders Where's the risk tolerance at? You know, University of Kentucky for calving is direct on an Angus base will say seven or higher, you're good. So right. in Colorado, where's their PAP BPD if they say we're good? That quite, oh, so where 95% of them are gonna, you know, I'm gonna have to take a guess on that. Um, I am going to guess, um, pull, up, pull back the range, I don't know if I can go back, how quickly I can go back on this. Um, Negative four to 11. I would say that most of them are probably sitting about a negative two or three to five or six. That, that's probably where it would be. I could be wrong because I, I, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm guessing at this point. In terms of risk though, that answer is gonna depend, okay? And, and, and the reason I say that is, is because one, it's gonna depend on the elevation that they're gonna be used, right? So the higher the elevation, the lower that PAP needs to be, right? And so the other question is, is do you currently have any problems, okay? Initially, when we came out with this EPD for Angus and we started publishing and asking these questions, we would say, you know, anything below zero. And, and, and um, but depends on the elevation. And, and it, and actually, a, a very good resource for this is the Beef Improvement Federation, their, their guidelines. There's, a, there's a, a, a section on PAP, and it gives all of the different elevations for intended use, and it gives all of the different elevations on where the PAP was recorded. So PAP is one of those interesting traits, right? Because, you know, as animal breeders, and Daryl will attest to this, we spend all of our time telling producers to stop looking at the phenotype and look at the EPD to make selection decisions. Okay, but for PAP, I'm going to tell you, you have to do both because in, for PAP, if you're sending an animal to elevation, they have to survive in that environment and that's their phenotype, right? So they have to have an acceptable PAP. If we're going to use that animal for breeding purposes, you want to look at the EPD, Right, and so the, the, the difference is because there's a whole other host of things on you know, whether they had BRD or they're treated for BRD. There's all these other things that can cause an increase in PAP and that all affects their ability to survive at elevation. But 
whether or not they had BRD and they have lung damage associated with that, that's not gonna translate to their progeny, right? So you've gotta look at the EPD for breeding purposes, but so I'm gonna say it depends. It's just gonna be depend on wh what elevation that was measured and then where it's gonna end up being used. But lower is always better, okay? One more question yep. before we break Thank here. You. Thank you, Dr. Spadell. Um, I'm a little confused. I saw how you measured the PAP. Yep. I didn't see how you measured heart score, but in one of your later slides, you said the heart scores were cheaper and more abundant. Um, are we eventually going to, would we be better off at least for the feedlot heart situation to actually be measuring heart scores since we can collect a lot more of those cheaply? And how do you go about doing that? So that's what we, so, so what happens is, is just like those animals go into the plant and we stand right there on the, right there on the gut table. It's just like you go in and collect, you go in and collect a ribeye area or whatever. We stand right there on the gut table. They'll lay that heart, and we can score them just as they go across. Um, it is a terminal measure. It, it, oh, it is. It, it is very. It is a terminal measure. Yes, yes. One good thing, interestingly enough, we've got a, another scientist at uh, Clay Center, who's who's does a lot of video. Uh, you know, video analysis, and we're looking at maybe a way to put a, a camera in and score those, have an automatic algorithm to score those, just like they have the cameras that measure, that measure those. So that's, that's something we're looking to in the future. Dr. Spidell, thank you a lot. Mm -hmm. He'll be back on, on stage to answer questions at the end. We really appreciate that presentation. I heard this presentation in a session where we had three of these, Dr. Holt being one of them at our Beef Improvement Federation Symposium in Calgary last summer. And uh, I thought it was the best session I've ever attended because we get, did get the whole gamut. By the way, I mentioned Beef Improvement Federation Symposium. The 2024 Beef Improvement Federation Symposium will be held in Knoxville, Tennessee, June the 10th, 11th, and 12th. And you're all invited to attend that event. Be a really great event, we think. We're going to try to make it very special and oriented toward the southeast. So if you want to mark that on your calendar, June 10th, 11th, 12th and at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, and uh, there'll be a lot of information in Cal Country News, that kind of thing about it, but we, you're sure invited to attend that event.